my foes are many they rise against me but i will hold my ground i will not fear the war i will not fear the storm my help is on the way my help is on good yeah, we didn't even need the thumbs up all right everybody come on in here we have lots of instructions for this worship here we're going to worship the lord so go ahead and stand up if you can and then we're going to do a kick and clap hands on like this there we go everybody i will say before the level of your love come down with my hands to heaven 
and shout your praises loud. I was lost in darkness when you pulled me out. I will sing forever of your love come down. I will sing it forever of your love come down. My hands to heaven, shout your praises loud. I was lost in darkness when you pulled me out. I will sing forever of your love come down.
guide us in this time, Lord, while we're still here on this earth, and um, bless the rest of this worship and this time of greeting, please, Lord. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and greet each other.
punishment that brought us peace was upon him. By his wounds, by his wounds, we are healed. He was pierced for our transgression, he was crushed for our sins. Punishment that brought us peace was upon him. By his wounds, by his wounds, we are healed. We are healed by your sacrifice. You
His wounds, by His wounds we are Exodus, 
That would mean Exodus chapter 1, <clears throat> if you're new to the Bible, which I'm sure you're not. If you have a cell phone, <clears throat> turn it off unless you use it to read your Bible, which <clears throat> if you do, get one of these. They're pretty handy. They don't go off in the middle of service, so <laughs> that's helpful. But if your cell phone does go off and make noise, We'll have to embarrass you and make a spectacle of you, just giving you a heads up and a warning. So um, if you have to leave the room, just please sit out there or slip into the last row, whatever. Brian will let you know what you have to do there. Sunday, uh, special day, Rock Island brothers and sisters are going to be coming up for service. It should be a real blessing. Uh, we'll have, be having communion with them. They will be taking over the service. So uh, be prepared for some awesome worship, mostly in Swahili, and they will translate for us. But uh, the Holy Spirit really does a good job of it. I've found that, uh, man, it just is a real blessing, the koinonia that the Lord has given us with these brothers and sisters. So. That's a real blessing. There's a prophecy conference coming up at the end of the month in Appleton, the 26th through the 28th. I'll be speaking there. Um, if you want more details, you can go on Calvary Chapel Appleton website, and they have a list of speakers and everything. There's multiple Bible studies throughout the week, so um, you can be involved in those. And there's a calendar on the front table. Uh, out by the foyer area that has the listing of all of things that are going on. So um, help yourself to that and be involved in those types of things. Lord, we thank you, God, for your word and God, that we can just freely meet and uh, study it. These brothers and sisters coming on Sunday, many of them have just recently been freed from persecution in Africa, and uh, Lord, our, we just take so many things for granted. God, I don't want to do that. I want to be so grateful and, and Lord, take advantage of the opportunities we have as the body of Christ to Lord, worship you, to fellowship, to be washed in the word, and then as a body corporately to pray together, God, as you call us to do as we see the book of Acts doing or the church there in the book of acts they were in one accord they would meet together not just to sit and listen to peter talk but lord they would meet and they would be in one accord as a body and that's your desire lord you want every every part of the body working together and doing its part to the building up unto the headship of our lord jesus christ he is the head not some person singing not some person it's speaking not uh, anyone on this earth, Lord, has any right to take the place you alone take over your church. You bought us with your own blood, Lord. And so we bow before your majesty and your holiness, and we go through your word verse by verse, book by book, and allow it to speak to us, Lord, not just what Pastor Jeff picks out or Pastor Brian or Sean or whoever is teaching God, but your word lord just going through it and letting it speak and so i pray as we go through exodus a very important book and foundational for many of the things we believe i pray that your holy spirit would teach us and give us understanding lord i ask in jesus name amen now these are the names of the children of israel who came to egypt each man and his household came with Jacob, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher. All those who were descendants of Jacob were 70 persons, for Joseph was in Egypt already. And Joseph died, all his brothers, in all that generation. But the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly, multiplied, grew exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. Uh, here, the word Exodus, name of this book, at least in the Bible, is Greek for the going forth, and it applies mainly to the first section of this book, where God's people are delivered from their bondage in Egypt, chapters 1 through 19. Chapters 20 through, 30, uh, 30, 20 through 40 pertain to, yeah, that's a new number I just made up, so... <laughs> 
chapters 20 through 40 pertain to the giving of the law and the organization of God's chosen people around the institution of an earthly theocracy. And so it's very, like I said, very foundational, this book. Israel in Genesis was the name given to Jacob, the father of this large dysfunctional family. Israel in Exodus is a nation, but it's a nation like no other, as we're going to see as we move along here in the book. This is God's chosen nation, his instrument through which he is going to work redemption for all of humanity. Now, the first seven verses are transitional from Genesis. The first word is a conjunction, literally and, as though just picking up right from where Genesis left off. Verses 1 through 3 are a condensed reiteration of Genesis chapter 46 with a key word there in verse 1 that each man and his household came with Jacob to Egypt. It says in verse 5 that the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons, as it said in chapter 46. But in chapter 46, the households of each of these descendants was just assumed and it can come off like it's a relatively small number, 70 people coming. But when households are included, meaning wives, concubines, children, grandchildren, servants, and all the servants' family, the number of people who had immigrated to Egypt becomes significant. Abraham's household, for instance, in Genesis 14, consisted of 318 adult males, not counting women and children. So 70 such households, that would mean tens of thousands of people, depending on the size of each household, which helps to understand then how later on in just a few centuries, when you get to chapter 12, it's, it can say that after 400 some years in Egypt, there were 600,000 men, not counting women and children, who along with a mixed multitude, produce estimates of probably two to three million people leaving Egypt under Moses. And so a slight but significant clarification here, along with the names of Jacob's 12 sons, that provides a link then with what was given in Genesis. The technical transition between Genesis and Exodus takes place in verses 6 and 7, where it says, And Joseph died, all his brothers, and all that generation... But the children of Israel were fruitful, increased abundantly, and multiplied, grew exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. Now, although he was the youngest, Joseph died first amongst the twelve brothers. Verse 6 presents a note of finality. Literally, the way that it's inferred there is Joseph died, his brothers died, and the whole generation, children, grandchildren of those who had immigrated to Egypt, all died. So after all the drama, all the intrigue that you read about in those final chapters of Genesis between uh, Joseph and his brothers and all these things that went on, this is all it says. All those people died, and life on earth carried on just the way it always does kind of thing. This is the way it's implied. And the oldest man in the world died today. I don't know if you knew that. You might want to send him some flowers. Vincent Perez Mora of Venezuela died at 114 years old. He got this little blurb on a news site and just like this human interest story. Oldest man in the world died. Well, now there's another oldest man, I'm sure, today. I, I'm not me, but I feel like it. But that was it, you know, I mean, but that's more than the 8,000-some other people just here in the United States who died today. From the time service started, 7 o'clock until it ends, around 500 people will die not here, thankfully, but somewhere in the United States, every hour, 500 people on average die. Worldwide, every second, two people die. A death has a high mor mortality rate, for it is appointed unto men once to die, and then the judgment, Hebrews 9, 7. Everybody, unless we get raptured, now, it's written, written here with that same tone of finality. They all died. That's the ending of Genesis. 
But verse 7, the beginning, is described in this progression of extremely emphatic verbs there in verse 7. Where it's like the children of Israel were fruitful, increased abundantly, multiplied, grew exceedingly mighty. The land was filled with them. To say they were fruitful, that means their offspring became like fruit trees. They're just overflowing with fruit. They increased abundantly. It's a word that means to swarm like insects. But not just numerically, but they also multiplied and grew exceedingly mighty. That speaks of the physical condition of this large number. They were overall very strong, very healthy, and the land of Goshen especially was filled with them. Now the description is intended to show that all of this was being done by the hand of God. Israel's greatness that made them stand out to everybody else in Egypt was not the result of their resourcefulness. They could have remained a small number of people who achieved great amount of wealth, became very great, like a little handful of people. They could have monopolized political power through shrewd dealings, become great. But such an immense increase of a physically strong, healthy population that filled the land could only be seen as divine favor. They have favor of God. And so God's hand is seen in forming his chosen people into the instrument that he's going to use to bring about his purposes here on earth. And with that, there arose the earthly opposition, as is introduced in verse 8. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who didn't know Joseph. See, whenever God is working, you can expect opposition. So much so that it's been said, if I am not conscious of being opposed, I better watch out because I'm in danger. There, there's no opposition. Something's up. Okay. As God prepared his nation, Satan prepared his opposition. Egyptian rule was well known for their transfer of power dynastically the throne of leadership passing down to the next generation of the same Egyptian royal family. When it says here there arose a new king, that's speaking of a completely new dynasty. It's a different Egyptian family altogether. To say he arose over Egypt is a phrase that implies a new order of administration or form of wielding authority, unlike that of Joseph. Joseph had the best interests of the people in mind when making national societal decisions. This new king did not know Joseph. In other words, he did not acknowledge Joseph's positive influence, which had prevailed for several centuries. Now, it's interesting, through the discovery of what is called the Rosetta Stone, in 1799, this stone tablet that enabled researchers to translate ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics for the first time in modern history. In their translation, this is just Napoleon found this thing, and in the next, you know, during the 1800s, they were deciphering it. Over 25,000 references, either directly or indirectly, relating to biblical events, biblical people were uncovered from that ancient time period. It's shut up a lot of critics. Okay, go, oh, so that's what that's talking about. Oh, so these people did exist. The exact identity of this new king, however, is still unknown. This guy here in verse 8, there's debates, there's guesses by historians, but all that's known of him is that he didn't know Joseph. Joseph's identity has done nothing but grow over thousands of years. Joseph's story has been translated into, it's been taught in almost every language on earth. But some great, conquering, important, influential ruler, boss and everybody around you, rises to, to supreme power over the largest empire on earth at the time, and all the world needs to remember, all history records, is he didn't know Joseph. That's all that's known about that guy. But he enters prominently into the narrative here. It says in verse 9, and he said to his people, Look, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. 
come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply, and it happen in the event of war, that they also join our enemies and fight against us, and so go up out of the land. So the new king's designation of the Jews as the people of the children of Israel, as he spoke to his people, that's showing how this new ruler is playing up the fact that even after 430 years of living in Egypt, the Jews remained foreigners. To 430 years, they were living there in Egypt and they were still separate. They were separate religiously, culturally, politically within the Egyptian nation. Actually, when he says in verse 9, literally it's, he said to his nation, Look, the nation of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we are. So a nation within a nation. A separate nation with no indigenous homeland of their own. So it makes Israel so unique. Where is their homeland? And we know where they were, what God gave to them. But when they were dwelling there in Egypt, now you're talking, you know, tens of thousands of people, upwards of millions but they would be viewed as Canaanites, except that they weren't Canaanites. They were Semitic descendants of Noah's son, Shem. Canaanites and Egyptians are descendants of Noah's son, Ham. That's a distinction that was still very prominent in that day. It was really all, prominent all the way up until Christ. Our three synoptic gospels in our New Testament are each written to Shem, Ham, and Japheth's descendants, a, a, a narrative of what Christ did when he came to this earth. Matthew is written to a Semitic people, and Mark is written to Hamatic people, and Japheth is written to a Japhetic people. Those of kind of European. And you find this, the language, everything involved in them. John's written years later to just, you know, reinforce the fact that Jesus is God. But really up until the time of Christ, those distinctions were totally, you know, evident. And you see that in the Gospels. You have someone, you know, Simon the Cyrene carries the cross of Jesus. He would be a Hamite. They would know that. The, the Roman guard there, the centurion, he would be from the line of Japheth. That's why those are put in there. You see it in the book of Acts. You see the gospel go first to the Semitic line in Acts 2. Then you see it specifically saying how, you know, there was a, a, a guy from Africa, the Ethiopian eunuch, a Hamite, came all the way up and the gospel was preached to him and he took it back to Africa. And then Peter was sent to the home of the Cornelius, the centurion, who was of the line of Japheth, the European guy. And so you see the gospel go out. It's very clear. But at that time, the gospel is what broke down those barriers. And you see that in Paul's epistles. But all of that to say, you know, here is a nation of Semitic people. That makes the division even more conspicuous here in that the children of Israel are a Semitic nation within a Hamatic nation and the new king is using anti-Semitic language just as future leaders such as Haman of Persia, Hitler of Germany, and a multitude of national leaders today are using anti-Semitic language to try and annihilate the Jews. Ironically, the Jews were not a threat at the time. They were actually an asset, as is going to be seen as you go along here in Exodus. But fear of them is incited by this ruler. They're more and mightier than we are. They weren't, but this guy is a politician, dude. He knows how to work this. Things haven't changed in thousands of years. The Jews do have a mighty cod, and he recognizes that. But first, this ruler incites fear, and then he asserts a false hypothetical accusation in verse 10. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply, and it happen in the event of war that they join our enemies, fight against us, and so go up out of the land. Come on, literally. He's, he's drawing the people into an incitement to action. So all of this being the language of a new dynastic ruler seeking to consolidate power 
to himself. Us and them, he's saying, we and they. You know, he's drawing this, this division. Instead of open force, using it, you know, instead of that being his policy, he establishes a strategy to suppress further growth of this Semitic nation dwelling in their midst. Not because, notice, he's not afraid of them taking over. They're afraid that they're going to leave. That's the funny thing about this. It's like, dude, don't let, we don't want them to leave. That's showing on one hand how valuable the Jews were to the Egyptian economy. We can't kill them or kick them out. We need them. But also it shows how it was understood by everybody that the Jews had no intentions of becoming Egyptians. They can live here as long as they feel, but everyone knew they were not going to become Egyptians. The promises, the beliefs that had been instilled in these people through their ancestors, their forefathers, were obviously well known even to the Egyptians. The Jews and the nation of Israel, at least in their minds, they were destined for another place outside of Egypt, which sheds even greater light on all of this just as in so many other pivotal moments, you know, in redemptive history here on earth, both nationally and, but also individually, the only way for God's people, very, pretty much all the time, to take the necessary next step of faith is to have some contrary force imposed upon me, basically. I mean, how many people do you know who are gonna wager everything they have on faith when they don't have to. I don't know very many people who do. Very people, very, very few people do that. I mean, those who do, you know, it's very admirable. But most people, in order to take steps of faith, they have to have some kind of hardship imposed upon them. So many of God's works here on earth are accomplished through an initial testing and a trial and then they're sustained and they're kept going through the same testing and trial. That is how God has to kind of urge his people along. That's why the Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10 that all these things happened to them for our examples and they were written for our admonition. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 11 speaking specifically of the Exodus generation who would not, you know, walk by faith. They had to get whipped to leave Egypt. Now, as the Apostle James makes clear, it's not God who sends the test or the trial. God doesn't, you know, take the whip and whip people. He's not the author of evil. Evil has invaded God's creation, and God restrains it for his purposes. All God has to do is lift his hand of grace off of those who wander from him into worldliness and think, oh, I'm going to make have a better time of it with the world. I'm going to have a better time trusting the world. They're going to be more faithful to me than God. All God does is allow you to have a taste of the full fruit of what you think is so desirable. Here, have at it. And all of a sudden you find out this is not what I thought it would be. <laughs> These Jews weren't about to leave Egypt on their own. As it says in verse 7, they were prospering. Dude, they were healthy and growing strong. Yeah, let's have some fun and go wander around in a barren wasteland and have to depend completely on God just for food and water. That sounds like a great idea. Anyone with me? You know, come on, dude. They didn't go. That's why they had so many a hard time getting people to come back and rebuild the city during Ezra and Nehemiah's time. People were like, you're kidding. I don't want to go back to a bunch of rubble. They had a great in Babylon, actually. These people are destined for the promised land. They believed that. Think of that. They believed it. They refused to assimilate into Egyptian society because of it. We are separate. We are not Egyptians. All they need is this initial prompting to get them on their way because they're not going to leave otherwise. And it's this guy who's allowed to do it. Therefore, verse 11, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh supply cities, Pithom and Ramesses. The Jews go from being respected 
from being business people, successful subculture within Egyptian society, they go from that to being forced into slavery. You know, one of the shocking things that is brought out when you go to Israel and they take you through a tour of the Holocaust Museum, how shocking is how fast the Jews were reduced into a beaten down status within German society. You see how fast, how quick it can happen. And it, 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 some of the same steps you see that were being taken there are being taken in our own country. But everyone touring Israel is taken through Yad Vashem so that people don't forget the museum recreates the homes of several Jews using all their own original property. It's like you walk right through their house. Look at how these people were living. They're living just prior to Hitler's rise in power very successfully. And then step by step, you walk through the process of forced submission that was imposed upon the Jews from their being herded into ghettos to then into death camps and finally gas chambers. It's a horrific experience, very similar to what takes place right here. The word taskmasters in verse 11 means literally lords of tribute showing how the progression into slavery began with greater and greater taxation, forcing the Jews into more and more laborious work to pay their taxes and eventually into a violent oppression of slavery. So it wasn't like some guy just went out with a whip one day and said, get to work and start beating on people. But their means of prosperity was gradually removed until they were serfs of a tyrant. You know, they keep saying, you know, the economy's booming, everything's going good, but dude, our, our taxes sure, or our groceries se sure seem to be going up. Gas sure seems to be going up. Everything seems to be going up. I guess I'm supposed to believe it's going great, but things seem, seem to be, you know, going up and up. Heavier and heavier taxes there in Egypt were imposed, which they were under obligation to pay, diminishing their wealth causing them to work longer and longer hours for less and less wages. The Jews were herdsmen, they were farmers. Here they're forced to leave that line of work and go work construction jobs for the government, building whole cities, supply cities, verse 11. Pithon and Ramesses were large outposts on the northern border that would house food and weapons so as to be ready in the event of war. The same cities were dedicated to Egyptian false gods. So it's like this ruler is trying to force them away from their powerful God, who was obviously blessing them. Verse 12 gives further insight into the motivation behind this imposed labor. It says, but the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were in dread of the children of Israel. So the scheme was to oppress the Jews under heavy labor so as to diminish their numerical growth, force them to travel and work at long distances away from their families, away from home with a systematic strategy to reduce the Jewish population. As is going to be seen here as you go along, but the plan produced a completely opposite outcome which only caused a growing hatred, it says. It's what's described at the end of verse 12. The superstitious Egyptians were horrified, literally. They were really afraid of these Jews because they sensed something supernatural is going on here, which there was. God's blessing them in spite of your oppression. And so the Egyptians, first it says in verse 13, they made the children of Israel serve with rigor, and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage and mortar in brick and in all manner of service in the field. All their service in which they made them serve was with rigor. So this is portraying a transition from just heavy oppression, making life difficult financially, making life difficult physically, and you know, families trying to separate families to now enforced slavery to make them serve with rigor that speaks of cruelty, treating them harshly. So no, so no longer just long hours and hard circumstances, which would normally reduce population growth, but it didn't. 
Now the Egyptians feel the need at this point to physically subdue the Jews. Life for the Jews, verse 14, became a bitter experience. This is an extreme example of what takes place throughout the world in different measures every day. I mean, if you can cross the, you know, the Swahili barrier on Sunday, talk to some of our brothers and sisters who, you know, have been brought here through World Relief Organization to the, to the Quad Cities where they have, you know, a, a society built up. We just happen to be in the right place in the right time to give them a church building. And praise God, we get a great connection with them. But I remember talking the last time they were here a few months ago, I'm talking to a brother, he's still got bruises on him. He was, you know, gone for a couple months, dude. He got beaten so bad. And, but he wasn't, like, crying and pouring out his woes. He was, dude, he was beaming. He's here in America. He gets to praise God freely. Dude, he comes into church where everybody is loving on him. Do you want some clothes? Those clothes, how much are those clothes? They're free. You know, They just cleared them all out and took them with them. You've got to be kidding me, dude. They're going out with armloads of stuff. But, I mean, that's how it is for many people. They, many seek to make the life of someone else bitter unto their own advantage. That's human nature, from the bully on the school bus to the tyrannical dictator over a nation of people. The current estimates figure over 50 million people on Earth right now are in forced labor. It's called slavery. It's just different for forms of it. But they're producing a $7 billion a year industry for those who force them into this. An organization called Shared Hope International reports that miners are sold on average 13 to 15 times a day, totaling 10 to 15,000 sex acts a year. There in Egypt, at the time of the Exodus, extreme measures of hard labor were being inflicted upon the Jews, not to accomplish some great task anymore, they're not just building a city. They're, they're just being forced into this to weaken them through the making of mortar and brick work. That's not building anything. That's making and stockpiling bricks to be used for future projects. They're just making bricks and stack them up over there. It's called busy work where I used to work. And just move, you know, the rock pile from there over to there. We got to kill some time. And that's what you did. Okay. And you clock out. But in reality, the work was forced with the main intent of crushing the Jews. When it says service in the field, that refers to canal work. Historians like Josephus record the Jews being ordered to part the Nile River into many canals and raise up embankments against flooding. It's definitely hard work shoveling, hauling mud. The main thing emphasized here, though, is that the hard work was being done under cruel treatment. In verse 15, then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, of whom the name of one was Shifra and the other, the name of the other Bua. And he said, when you do the duties of a midwife for the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stools, if it is a son, then you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, then she shall live. So taxation doesn't work. Long, grueling hours didn't do it. Enforced slavery, harder and harder cruel treatment. None of that works, so they resort to ethnic cleansing. The Hebrew midwives, they, they, these midwives have Semitic names, so they're Jewish. Some people think, well, they were just, you know, Egyptians over them. No, these are Jewish women. And they're assumed to be the heads over all the midwives. These two women were not delivering millions of babies all the time. They were over like the midwife, you know, group. They were given orders by the king that when carrying out their duties in the midst of the birth, they were to watch carefully, and as the child was being born, if it was a male, they were to kill him on the birthing stool, verse 16. So in the process of delivery, they were to make it appear as though the child was stillborn. A very gruesome you know, manner of reducing the Jewish population. 
But see, this would also force assimilation. You know, with no males, the, the Jewish women would have to marry Egyptians and the, the population would be assimilated into to survive. According to a news article, I don't know if you saw this, this was another just sub-article. This was published, you know, Monday. A Czech Republic hospital last week had a, a bit of a mix-up between two pregnant women. One came in for a checkup for her pregnancy. The other came in for an abortion. Doctors at the hospital confused the two women, and the woman four months pregnant who came in for a checkup received an abortion instead. Like, oops, sorry. You know, how tragic. It's going to be interesting to see how they, you know, prosecute this case. Is this a murder? What, how do you prosecute it? I don't know. The country, obviously, is pretty liberal. But again, yes, it's bound to happen, you know, and abortion is just routine. There in Egypt, this wasn't routine. This was a command of an evil dictator. It says in verse 17, but the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the male children alive. So when I fear God above everything else, everything else is going to lose its power to intimidate me. As is seen here, you can do whatever you want to do. <laughs> I answered one authority, and that's God. What was evident to everybody else at this point was that this new ruler, this Pharaoh himself feared the God of the Hebrews. Not in a reverential way. He was genuinely frightened of whoever they worship. Even though in his foolish pride, he's going to stand against him. But Pharaoh is experiencing, you know, each step of the way, the power behind this unique nation. Here that fear or that a genuine reverence, literally, is manifested in the hearts and actions of those who know the true and living God, who know the, the, who God is, these midwives. Rather than fear and obey the king, who they would see face to face, they feared and obeyed God, who they couldn't see an invisible God. They didn't even have icons or idols. But they knew that, you know, they were, they were, he was the one ultimately on the throne, and they saved male Hebrew children's lives instead of killing them. Now, ancient times, it was the usual observation that when the king's guard, when you would go by the castle and the king's guard was stationed at the door of the castle and he was not allowing anyone entrance without careful examination, that was evidence to everybody walking by that the king is in there, even though he couldn't be seen. When the guard was absent, the gate was open for anyone to enter, that was obvious sign the king's not home. The king's not there, that he, he was out of town on a mission, something. And that's the same way it is with a true child of God, and it is the marked expression of genuine fear or reverence of God. When the king is present within, the guard is on duty at the gates of my senses, my eye gate, my ear gate. Those are being guarded. Everything that enters is very carefully monitored. That's the evidence that the Lord dwells within, even though he's not seen. This person will not watch this. He will not listen to this. He walks away when you talk this garbage. When there's no guard, there's no fear, free access is granted to any desire that approaches, obviously the Lord is not at home. Now, God was definitely at work there in Egypt. Everybody saw it. The Egyptians and the Jews, everyone knew it. Some opposed it, like this ruler and others, but others like these Hebrew midwives wisely bowed to God's authority, even though they couldn't see him. They bowed to God's authority, even in the disobedience of this evil king. Their lives were and it remained for all history a display of here's the fear of God. What happens if the government says that you can't meet and you can't worship God and you have to do this and you have to, you know, support this certain lifestyle or whatever it is? 
onto jail time. Dude, that's we're coming down to those types of, uh, you know, things going on in our country right now. There are, there are court cases around the country on that for people who will not say a per personal pronoun the right way, dude, and they're getting fired from their jobs. It says in verse 18, So the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this thing and saved the male children alive? And the midwife said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are lively and give birth before the midwives come to them. Now the direct question by Pharaoh in verse 18 correlates exactly with the actions of the midwife spoken of in verse 17. That is, which, you know, that is purposeful. For whatever reason, that makes it plain to the reader that these midwives just outright lied. Some Bible expositors have sought to sugarcoat the response. Oh, it was kind of a half-truth. and any, Anything but what is blatantly obvious. They just bald-faced lied to him, and God showed them favor. There's a lot of people, I don't know how to deal with that. Well, God says, deal with it. You know, <laughs> That's how it goes down. The accusation of Pharaoh is that not only did they not do as he said, but they are aiding in keeping Hebrew babies alive. Their lie consisted in saying that they weren't even present when the births were taking place. These Hebrew women, you know, they're saying, you know, they're saying these Hebrew women, unlike pampered Egyptian women who need, you know, 15 midwives, these Hebrew women are extremely healthy, strong, capable of delivering children without assist assistance. They can deliver their own children. That may have been true in some cases, and it was possible that Hebrew women were foregoing midwifery altogether for fear of this. But the wording in the passage is clear that these Hebrew midwives were not only attending births, but verse 17, they were saving the lives of infants as they were being born. So this provides a very interesting situation here in Scripture because it's made clear that they are lying. So is this saying that it's okay to lie is a question people ask. We have people call in biblical insights and stuff like that. Is it okay to lie then? Or that God sanctions lying? Does God approve, you know, or bless lying? Well, you look closely at the following verses in verse 20. Therefore God dwelt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very mighty. And so it was because the midwives feared God that he provided households for them. What's made equally clear in this passage is that these women were not acting out of any selfish motive. It wasn't for their own benefit, even, that they lied. They weren't doing What they were doing was out of fear of God, verse 17. And that is made clear, and God dealt well with them, not because they lied, but because they feared God sufficiently to disobey God the evil king at the risk of their own lives, and God blessed them in kind and in keeping with his original promise to Abraham. See, the midwives not only preserved, but they saved lives. They did all they could do to ensure that Jewish household grew, and so God in turn, in turn provided households for them, verse 21. Not an easy thing for them to do, in those days under the oppression they were living under but it's nothing for god he says i'll make your household prosper and flourish their personal families were built up and so it was not their dishonesty that was rewarded but it was their fear of god as is distinctly pointed out twice in the passage and their obedience to god's covenant promise made to Abraham and his descendants under the Abrahamic covenant. You bless, God will bless him who blesses his descendants and curse those who curse him. So if someone can, out of their fear of God and risk to their own lives, bless the Jews through dishonesty, 
God who alone evaluates at that motivational level and is the only one in the position to judge, he will reward a person in kind. He's not going to reward you lying. But he will reward, he looks upon the motivations of the heart and he will reward in kind. Whatever you're doing for the Jews to further them and uphold them. Here, here he will reward that in kind in spite of your methods. And so untangle that and present it to God and, and he will tell you how it works out. Now Pharaoh, seeing that his plan up to this point has not worked, says in verse 22, he commanded all his people saying, every son who is born literally to the Hebrews, you shall cast into the river and every daughter you shall save alive. And so the ultimate manifestation of evil now, no more strategies, no schemes, no playing games with midwives. All Egyptians are commanded, throw every son born to the Hebrews, there, throw them all into the river. You know, were this order to have been carried out to completion, it would mean the extermination of the Jews. You think, dude, how awful. But what would be the abortion rate in our country if it wasn't for Christians taking an active stand against it? They just said, dude, and nobody cared, and you just abort whatever you want if there was no stigma attached to it. See, as it is, less people attend the Super Bowl than there are abortions in New York City in one year. More people were killed by their own parents I shared last year, or a few weeks ago, abortion was the leading cause of death worldwide. No other cause of death. More people killed by their own parents than any other cause of death last year. That's the world we live in. So in a pagan culture like Egypt, there was no stigma upon this. You read of Roman times, that if a woman didn't want her child, she just tossed them over the, over the wall. And people would go, oh, how, how awful. They just said, oh, hey, so I see you had a kid. Yeah, I got rid of him. You know, that was the, the attitude. That's the way it is in a pagan culture. There's no stigma attached to this. It would have just been, okay, whatever, another order from our king. But this sets the stage here now for God to raise up his deliverer. You know, it's pretty extreme measures to get get them kind of motivated here, but it's kind of what it takes sometimes. And we'll see next time now the deliverer is going to come. Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, God, that you are faithful in all things and that we can trust you, God. And we pray that, God, as we have a final song, we break into prayer. That, Lord God, you would be glorified here in this place tonight, and our prayers, Lord, would be heard. God, we, we intercede for our nation, God. We don't want to see these things take place. And God, the greatest thing we can do is pray, and we can pray together, and, and, and Lord, be intentional in our prayers and serious in it. And so I pray, Lord, that that would be the case tonight as we are just praying lifting up our sorry nation, Lord, in the path it's going down. God, we need you. We need you to turn the hearts of people back to yourself, God. In many cases, to revive your church, Lord, who would be offended by these things. And so hear our prayers tonight, God. Cause your word to dwell richly within us. And Lord, come quickly. Until then, God, just help us to serve you the best that we can. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. We'll have a final song by the new rock band. <laughs>